Okay, in this video we'll look at a second example of how to find intervals where a function is increasing or decreasing, but the difference will be in this example we'll have a critical point where the function does not change direction. It won't change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Now if you haven't done it yet, I would definitely watch part one of this series because it explains where this set of rules comes from, and we'll follow the same set of rules on this as we did it in the part one example. So again, if you haven't done it, definitely watch part one first, and this will make a lot more sense. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at a sample problem. Okay, the problem we'll look at this time is this. The function is x to the fourth minus 4x cubed, and we want to find intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. So back to the list of steps, and the steps look like this. The first thing to do is go ahead and find the first derivative because that will give you the critical points. So let's go ahead and do that. So on this problem, uh, step number one, find the first derivative. So we've got step number one. We want to find um, the first derivative, and we'll use the power rule to do that. So on this problem, you'll have f prime, the first derivative, f prime of x. And again, just using the power rule, that's going to be 4x cubed minus 12x squared. So here is the first derivative. Um, now we'll go back to our rules. So we've got the derivative. Now, to find the critical points, set the first derivative equal to zero and solve for x, or find values where it's undefined. And in this problem, since it's a polynomial, it will be defined everywhere, so we don't have to worry about part b. So, uh, there's the first derivative. Now, to set it equal to zero, we'll take the first derivative and set it equal to zero. So, 4x cubed minus 12x squared, and we're going to set this thing equal to zero. Now, to solve this, you can go ahead and factor it. So both of these have at least a 4, and both of them have at least an x squared. So I'll factor the x squared out. And what that's going to leave me with will be an x minus 3. So back to the first derivative. Now, to solve this, go ahead and set each of the factors equal to 0. So I'll set this factor equal to 0 and this factor equal to 0. So this one will give me, when I solve this, this gives me x is equal to 0. There's one critical point. And this one gives me x minus 3 is equal to 0, or x is equal to 3. And there's another critical point. Now, that means that this, I'll circle this, this is a critical point here, and this is a critical point here. So these are points where you're going to have a horizontal tangent. So a critical point here and a critical point here. As we talked about in that part one example, um, you don't have to do it, but again, these problems will make a lot more sense if you sketch a quick graph of it. So what I'm going to do is this. Draw a number line, and I'll go up here. This will be zero on the number line, and there's going to be a critical point right there. Then somewhere over here, here will be three, so I'll put a three here, and this will also be a critical point. So I've got two critical points on the graph. So now let's go back to our set of rules. Uh, we found the critical points, and we're going to use that to divide it up into separate intervals, so on step number three. So what I'll do next is just go to my graph, and I'm going to divide it up into intervals. I'll have an interval here that goes from, say, here straight through to here. And it'll go to about right here. Then I'll go from here and go straight through, say, to about here. So there's the intervals. So I've got a first interval that goes from here to here. And again, that goes from a negative infinity to zero. I've got a second interval that goes from here to here, from zero to three. And I've got a third interval that goes from here all the way out to a positive infinity. Or infinity. Looks like that. So to a positive infinity. <clears throat> Okay, so I've got step three done. Divide it, uh, use the critical points to divide the thing up into intervals. Okay, next thing. Pick a convenient test point inside each interval and evaluate the derivative to see if it's positive or negative. If it's positive, it means it's increasing. If it's negative, it means it's decreasing. So let's do that. This will be step four. So on step four, and we'll go ahead and put that down here, um, 
I'll pick a test point inside each interval. Now again, pick a convenient one. So I like to stay with integers, so I'm going to pick a negative one here. Um, I'll pick one here, and I'll pick four over here. So pick, the, pick an easy point, an easy point generally if the integers are your best. So now evaluate the first derivative at each of these points. And here you have a couple of options. You can plug it into, here was the original uh, derivative. And you can plug the numbers into this, but also you can plug it into the factored form. Remember, this also is the derivative. And in some cases, it's actually easier to plug it into the factored form. So that's what I'm going to do here. So what I'll do, I'll have f prime at negative 1. Then I'll want to find f prime at a positive 1. And then finally, I'm going to want to find f prime at 4. And again, the only thing I'm interested in here is whether they're positive or negative. So I'm going to plug them into this factored form of this thing. So I'll have 4 times a negative 1 squared times a negative 1 uh, minus 3. Now what that gives me would be, this is going to be a 4 and times a 1 um, and times a negative 4 which would turn out to be a negative 16 or just a negative. I'll go ahead and put a negative 16 here. But really all I'm interested in here is the fact that it is negative. And what that tells me is that this function is decreasing on the interval from minus, so it's going to be decreasing on this interval right here, and it's going to be decreasing from negative infinity to zero. So this will be decreasing from a negative infinity all the way to zero. And that'll be an open interval. <clears throat> now I'll go ahead and plug in the 1. So this is going to be 4 times 1 squared. And then I've got 1 minus 3. And what this gives me is 4 times 1 times a negative 2. And what that gives me is a negative 8 which again, though, is a negative. So again, the function is decreasing. And it's, that means it's going to be decreasing in this interval right here. So that's going to be from 0 to 3. So it's going to be decreasing in the interval from 0 to 3. <clears throat> now let's find the fourth interval, or third interval. We'll plug 4 in. So this is going to be 4 times 4 cubed, or 4 squared. So 4 squared, and then I've got a 4 minus 3. And that's going to give me a 4 times 16 times 1, which would give me a six, actually a positive 64. But again, I'm just interested in the positive part of it, so I'll put a positive here. Uh, the fact that the first derivative is positive tells you that the slope of the tangent line is positive, therefore the function must be increasing. So it has to be increasing on the interval from 3 all the way out to a positive infinity. So it has to be increasing on this interval right here. <clears throat> so you've got this step. So I'm going to go ahead and put a box around this because this actually is the solution to the problem. You wanted to identify intervals where it was increasing or decreasing. So we'll put a box around that. So there is the solution to the problem. Now let's go back and take a quick look at the rules. On this, what we do, we found a convenient test point. If the derivative is positive, it means the original function is increasing. If the derivative is negative, it's decreasing. So that's steps four and five combined. Now we'll go back to the graph here. <coughs> um, and at this point, I'm going to go ahead and sketch what uh, this graph would actually look like if we put it in. Um, and actually, I think let's do this first. Let's take a look at the... Uh, first derivative test. Now, in that last example, or the first example that we did, um, we showed how the first derivative ties into all this stuff. And let's do the same thing here. So let's take a quick look at the first derivative test. Now, what the first derivative test says is this. If c is a critical point on a function, if the derivative changes from 
positive to negative, in other words, if it goes from increasing to decreasing, you have to have a relative maximum at the critical point. If it goes from decreasing to increasing, you have to have a relative minimum at the critical point. And then finally, at the critical point, if the sign of the derivative does not change, in other words, it goes from increasing to increasing again, then you have neither a relative minimum or a relative maximum. So let's use this first derivative test to see what's going on at each one of those critical points. So first of all, uh, let's try this. Um, between these two points right here, so between this one and this one, now the function, it was decreasing, and it continues to be decreasing at the critical point. <clears throat> and what that tells you is that you have neither. So neither uh, a maximum or a minimum at x is equal to 0. Now on the first derivative test, what that actually is, that's going to be step number 3. Uh, the derivative did not change signs. It was decreasing and continued to decrease. Therefore, it's neither a relative maximum or a relative minimum. And again, the way you can tell that, it was negative and it stayed negative, which means it was decreasing and it continues decreasing. Now let's take a look at the second point. Between these two points right here, it goes from decreasing to increasing. So let's take a look at the first derivative test. <clears throat> and the first derivative test says if it goes from decreasing to increasing, where it's negative, this would be step two, then you must have a relative minimum right there. So back to the function again, since it went from decreasing to increasing, you have to have a relative minimum at um, x is equal to 3. Now again, you don't have to draw the graph, but let's just make a quick sketch to see how this everything ties together here. So what you've got is this. At the critical points uh, from step number 2, you know that f prime has to be equal to 0. And in this one, f prime has to be equal to 0. So you're going to have a horizontal tangent at those points. So what I'll do is come in and I'll just draw. I'm going to have a horizontal tangent uh, here. And I'm going to have a horizontal tangent somewhere down here. Now let's just put the sketch in real quick and look at it. What happens is the function has to be decreasing uh, in the interval from minus infinity has to be decreasing from here to here, and then it has to level off and have a horizontal tangent. So the function has to look something like this. It has to come in, level off right here just for a second, has a horizontal tangent right there. Then in this interval, it continues decreasing. So it's got to level off, have a horizontal tangent, and continue decreasing. Now we're not necessarily sure exactly how far down, but at some point down here, it has to do this it has to level off again and have another uh, horizontal tangent, so f prime is equal to zero. So after it levels off and it switches back to increasing in this interval, and the sketch of the actual graph would look something like that. So looking down here, what the first derivative test says is when it goes from decreasing to increasing, you have to have a minimum, and that's this step right here. And here it leveled off. Um, it went from decreasing to decreasing again, so you had neither. And sure enough, right here, it's not either a maximum or a minimum. So anyway, there's a second example of how to find increasing and decreasing intervals, but it's an example where just because you have a critical point doesn't necessarily mean that the function has to change from increasing to decreasing or the other way.